Switzerland, and partly in London, where I recorded our conversation not long ago. I started by talking about another side to her public face, for, as Julie Edwards, she writes children's books, first Mandy, and now the last of the really great Hwang Doodles, which Collins published in September. Mandy sold 100,000 copies, and she told me how it had come to be written. I sort of fell into it by accident. I, I must say I've always had a desire to be able to write or to try to write a book, but uh, never really thought about it seriously. And uh, I think I was in Paris making a film called Darling Billy with my husband, and uh, his daughter said to me, uh, oh, we were playing a game of some sort, and it was a dare uh, of some kind. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, I lost and had to pay a forfeit, and I said, oh, what should my forfeit be? And uh, she said, well, write me a story. And I said, oh, okay, and, and that's how Mandy began. And I so enjoyed writing Mandy that uh, I think that's why I, I felt sort of lost when it was finished. And uh, I, then I got the idea for the last of the really great Wang Doodles and uh, discovered that I just simply had to start to write again. Were you an imaginative child yourself? Because you were brought up in um, a show business atmosphere. Your, your parents were on the halls, as they say, when you were little. And one would think that that was a rather unusual and perhaps even unnatural childhood for a little girl. It, it probably was. I didn't realize it or think about it at the time. And uh, I don't feel that I missed out on an awful lot. My mother was awfully good about trying to keep me as natural as possible. I think, yes, I was probably rather imaginative. And I used to like writing even then. But that was purely for my own pleasure. What did you write about then? Can you remember what your fantasy world was? Oh, gosh. Um, mostly adventure stories, horse stories. I was horse cr crazy like any other early teenager or young child. A few fantasies, but uh, mostly, I think, stories that uh, included me in them. That was part of the fantasy. I'd like, if I may, to throw a quote at you. A critic called David Shipman said about you a couple of years ago that you embody all the best qualities of the stars of the 1930s, and by that he meant that you had in your roles always gaiety and common sense, and above all, he said, discipline. You know what to do and what not to do. Where did you get that discipline from that you have? Was that also from your family, from your parents? Um, yes, I think probably from having... Uh, I've been in show business for an awful long time. As I say, uh, I was a child sort of prodigy or whatever you care to call it. I think that touring a lot, as I did when I was young, gave me a, a great deal of discipline. Uh, and I think just the sheer number of years eventually gives you discipline. This business about knowing what to do and knowing what not to do, and discipline, of course, comes into this. How have you chosen roles in the past? By instinct. And sometimes I've been influenced by or my husband or maybe my agent uh, would explain a reason that it would be very good for me to do such and such a role but mostly I would say nine times out of ten it's I read a script and and it is that first feeling about it if you go by that, it, that then w whether it's successful or not at least it was y your instinct and your choice have you ever regretted a, a choice that you made professionally um, gosh um, professionally or otherwise I've regretted many choices I think it's part of learning, but, but the interesting thing is that whether I've regretted it or not, I can't honestly say that I regret having done anything that I've done because uh, I had so much fun and I learned so much while doing it. One film that must have been a really first-class choice for you was the first film you ever made, Mary Poppins, Walt Disney. What did you learn from that? Well, first of all, how to make a film, because I had never made a film before. Secondly, oh gosh, I think the magic of Disney, I was much influenced by it. I saw you know, just how wonderfully he um, created things for children. He was a spectacular man. Was he closely involved with the making of the films? Because he was getting on in years by that stage. Was he cl still closely involved with Mary Poppins? Yes, very much so. Um, he was involved with everything he did. I mean, uh, he, was, he loved his work. It was his passion. And whether it was creating that incredible Disneyland of his or, or whether it was a film or some project or a children's home or whatever, he was very, very involved, and he would come to work at like seven in the morning and uh, be there long before anybody else and uh, trying to find out, you know, what was going on in the creative departments and so on. 
Have you been interested yourself in the technical side of films? Because one of the delights of Mary Poppins was, of course, the, the technical expertise that made you and various other people in the cast dance with the cartoon characters. Yes, it was sort of baptism by fire because it, it really was uh, learning fast and hard. I am interested in the technical side of it, uh, probably because my husband is a director and I see him at work and find it quite fascinating. I think uh, that the technical side of filmmaking is... is well, no, I can't say it's almost the most exciting because it is the it is the incredible mixture of I mean the fact that somebody stands and says the right line at the right time and hits the right mark on the floor and that the camera happens to move in and the man who's changing the focus happens to be able to coordinate his actions with with the sound man who's trying to pick you up with a microphone and that it all works and finally gets processed into film. It's a very exciting thing. One, I imagine, very expensive technical feat was the opening shot of The Sound of Music, which was a marvellous shot of the, I imagine, taken from a helicopter flying over the Alps and then zooming down very slowly onto you in the middle of that wonderful green meadow. Oh, that was a very hard shot to get because it was a very cold day for a start and I was all bundled up in uh, blankets and shawls to keep myself warm. And then uh, we'd wait for the sun to come through the clouds. And it, it didn't come through very often uh, on The Sound of Music. We were not too lucky uh, with the sunshine in Austria. But when it did peek through, then it was, you know, quick, quick, let's get ready. And this giant jet helicopter would come towards me, come sideways towards me, because, of course, the cameraman was hanging out of the side of the helicopter. And uh, there was tremendous downdraft from the jet engines. And every time he had completed his shot, the pilot would swing the helicopter around me and go back to the other end of the field and come towards me again, because we couldn't take a chance on just doing it once. And every time the helicopter swung around me, uh, I would be knocked flat from the draft. And so it must have been about, oh, I think about eight times, maybe more, that I was just knocked right on my back. Is there still film extant of this? <laughs> I think there's probably a piece of film where I raised my fists and said, How could you do this to me? <laughs> uh, but uh, it, I saw the funny side of it, even while getting more and more furious. Actually, the filming of The Sound of Music was just filled with all sorts of... Uh, funny things and uh, that opening song uh, as, as well as the uh, being knocked down by the helicopter there were all sorts of things that happened you know uh, I don't know if you can recall the song but when I get to the middle part of the song where my heart wants to sing like the birds that fly and so on and so forth uh, the lark that is learning to pray uh, I think that's a rather difficult line that I try to get over very fast <laughs> yes um, uh, anyway the the uh, Camera angles are different. Uh, one minute you see me walking through the trees, the next minute you see me uh, throwing a stone in a brook and so on. Well, there was no brook around the location. Uh, in fact, we would have had to have moved uh, about uh, 80 people, plus cameras and everything, to, to, to find a brook. And so we decided to build one, or the company decided to build one. And uh, we got permission from the farmer and dug a ditch, lined the ditch with plastic, and uh, made a very suitable little brook for me to jump across and so on and so forth. Well, this was fine, excepting that the farmer got very angry with the film crew and decided that we were upsetting his cows and uh, uh, we were spoiling the cow's milk and it was no good. And he came along with a pitchfork in the middle of the night and punctured the plastic and so all the water disappeared. And one morning we had no brook, just a great big hole. So it had to be built all over again. Were you all conscious making that film with a marvellous scenery terrific music and lots of kids that it could just tip over the top into a cup of saccharin. Yes, very conscious. Um, there's no doubt about the fact that you put all those ingredients together and it could be awfully uh, sugary. But uh, our director, Robert Wise, and all of us all the way down the line tried awfully hard to uh, um, eliminate some of the saccharin from the, from the film and I, I think we did succeed. Well, there was certainly lots of fun in it, which people perhaps who haven't seen it don't, don't know. But in Thoroughly Modern Millie, you, had, you played with two wonderful female clowns, Beatrice Lilly and Carol Channing. And I wondered if you'd ever thought that you'd be good, I'm sure you would, at a real knockabout funny part. I'd love to try. Um, there aren't too many roles for ladies uh, that allow them to sort of do that kind of slapstick thing. You think of all the great slapstick uh, comedians, or, or they're usually men. There are exceptions, but usually they're men. And I said to my husband the other day, he's preparing to do a new um, Inspect Clouseau film uh, about the Pink Panther with Peter Sellers. And uh, I, we were talking about uh, Inspector Clouseau and the fact that he is a kind of man who can never do anything right and he's a clown. And I said then that they just don't write those sort of things for ladies and how I'd love to do something like that. The tamarind scene, you don't 
play a clownish part in that at all. No, and I don't sing in it, and it's a very straight, uh, dramatic role, but I enjoyed making the film tremendously. Are you good at backgammon? <laughs> no, uh, not backgammon nor bridge, and uh, Omar Sharif is sensational at both. Uh, he he uh, was the leading uh, male actor in the film, and it was just lovely to work with. If all this ended tomorrow, which heaven forfend, but if it did for any reason, how would you like to be remembered? That is a terribly hard question. Um, I've given fatuous answers from time to time, but I, the more I think about it, the harder I think it is to be answered. Uh, I think I would like to be remembered for having given some kind of pleasure to people. There is a wonderful feeling when you hear an audience laugh or you see children enjoying Mary Poppins uh, to be very corny or um, whatever. There's a marvelous feeling to say, gosh, I really helped them for one second. Uh, forget that there was the washing to be done or whatever and made them laugh it's a good feeling and if somebody pressed you even further and said can you pick one song that you've sung that embodies all that which one would you pick well the one that comes to mind immediately and i suppose because we've been talking about it is the theme song from the sound of music it was the song i was singing on that very cold day when the helicopter kept knocking me flat and it's such a pretty song